Irene and Jason, I appreciate you guys uh, taking time out of your schedule to, to join us this afternoon. Um, uh, both of you uh, have, have been some of our, our functions in the past. I, I know we've interviewed Jason a couple times, and Irene, I think we've interviewed you before also. Right. Um, so I'll, I'll spare you guys our, our standard spiel. I will say this much. We will be uh, holding a makeup day for interviews probably sometime in the next two or three weeks. Next weekend we're doing the county and um, some con some statewide races, some county races, and then the judicial races. Then we have the Labor Day weekend. The weekend after that, um, we have a um, uh, about a 300 person party, which we're 400, no? Three or 400 person party that we're having, so that's going to take up a lot of our time uh, there. So what we want to do is, uh, with our makeup days, get them done sometime before mid-September, and hopefully right around mid-September, mid to late September, get out our endorsements. Um, regarding that, we will be having uh, some ad space that we're gonna be purchasing in various Asian periodicals to, to print out all the individuals we're endorsing. Furthermore, once early voting starts on, was it October 18th, I think it is? Yeah, yeah. Um, what we're going to be doing is renting out uh, the Harbor Palace restaurant where we've been had many of our events before, and uh, having free lunch for everybody, for whomever wants to come by. We'll be handing out our slate cards there, and the people can walk and do early voting within the, the Chinatown complex itself. I think it's 105 feet away from the actual door. So, um, but we'll be encouraging people to do that as well. And again, that'll be probably on that first Saturday of early voting try and get the voters out there. So that having been said, um, uh, the reason I encourage you guys both to be up on the dais at the same time is really do we have two sitting assembly people uh, to field questions and the fact that you are neighbors geographically uh, is certainly helpful as well. Um, question that we'd like to start with is this. I'm going to start with Irene uh, because if there is a man and a woman, we're very chivalrous <coughs> here. We start with the female. Um, Lately, there's been a great deal of, uh, well, the civil rights issues have come to the forefront as of late. You know, we have this week, we had Ferguson County, um, but even in the past, uh, past few years, we've had the issues with respect to DOMA. We've had the issues with respect to some of Arizona's laws. Um, what ideas do you have uh, to take the Carson City to try and preemptively minimize the impact of these types of inequalities when they're highlighted uh, to try and lessen the divisiveness and strife that ensues when these kinds of issues arise. Uh, I think that you always have to start with education. Um, you notice that obviously uh, in the south, uh, southern Nevada, there's always um, a different presence here and so maybe in the rules or in northern Nevada there may not be the education that you need uh, to uh, let people know, right, the inequalities. And so I think I would start with that. Number two, I, we always play defense because uh, those issues do come up that people want to sponsor. And so trying to make sure that nothing like that comes to a committee uh, level or gets heard uh, to make sure that we, you know, take a stand and let them know that nothing like that will come across our desk. Jason. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled that you even asked that question. Social justice is my background, and so I rarely get a chance to talk about it because uh, very few times folks care about uh, those kind of issues. Um, I actually have a bill that uh, addresses that to some extent. I am, uh, I have submitted a bill to, to deal with voter registration and felon uh, restoration of their voting rights. Uh, we were called out by U.S. Attorney Eric Holder for being one of the few states uh, that's really harsh and makes it essentially impossible for a felon to ever retain the right to vote. And so I have a bill that restores it um, either automatically upon completion of a sentence of, or parole or probation um, or for the more serious crimes uh, of, of an additional period of time. Uh, I, we may accept our Category A felons as the most serious. Um, but, you know, if we expect those individuals to reintegrate into society as contributing members, then we need to give them the tools to be contributing members and not uh, have them pay their debt to society for the rest of their life. So that's just an example 
um, what, you know, what I have seen in the Judiciary Committee over the last couple of sessions. Um, but I think um, we have to continue to look at uh, justice reinvestment across the country, and, and we're behind. I mean, the other states have done tons of it, and Senator Sagerblum and I have been meeting with the, the Department of Corrections and the ACLU and some national organizations to look at our sentence, sentence reform and, uh, and also juvenile justice so that we can be forward thinking when it comes to social justice issues. I'm going to back you up. Yeah, you had talked about restoration of uh, voting rights. Did it restore any other rights, or was your bill just focused on voting itself? And My bill was focused it's exclusively on, on voting uh, okay. right restoration. That we, ha we have been working on uh, streamlining the record sealing process, and it's my understanding that uh, last session we made some changes to how record sealing takes place that in practice slowed it down. So what took six months is taking three more months now. And so you know Christy Craig and Vita Kamsey and I have been working with Barbara Buckley, and we actually had a meeting with, with Steve Wolfson about record sealing. And, and during the uh, interim finance committee, increased funding to the, the central repository, so they can hopefully speed that process up. And, and record sealing wall doesn't impact it does impact the significant from the amount of people. It, it, the process itself takes much longer right. than it should. As you, hopefully, you, neither one of you has had to do that, have you? <laughs> no. Well, give it time. <laughs> give it time. <laughs> <laughs> um, with both of your extensive amount of time and experience in. Carson, uh, and we'll start with Jason this time and then go to Irene. Jason, what do you see as the most dysfunctional aspect of the legislative process and how, what can we do to, to streamline or get around that issue? Um, this is probably not um, necessarily a politically popular thing to say, but the premise of your question, I think, is part of the dysfunction, and that is the fact that you refer to us as having a significant experience. We have two terms under our belt. And because of term limits, we're looking at being senior members of the legislature, which is frightening. The fact that we have lobbyists that have been around for decades that are proposing measures that maybe 10 years ago didn't work for whatever reason, well, we don't know what happened 10 years ago because we weren't there. They do. And they're looking forward to a chance to try it again. So I, I think that in a state that meets once every other year for only 120 days, for us to have uh, that limited amount of time and then be term limited, I think really ties our hands as far as how effective we can be. That being said, I don't want to do this for more than 12 years personally, but I do value having some folks around who have so that I can, uh, you know, rely on their institutional knowledge and experience. We're losing staff because we, when we make cuts, state, state uh, employees are the first to get cut. So why are they sticking around helping us cut their salaries when they can double their money in the private sector? Um, and then by the time we finally figure out how to do this job, it's time for us to move on to something else. Um, so I think that that is, in Nevada in particular, one of the most uh, dysfunctional um, things about how we are operating moving forward. Irene. Um, and I, I would agree with that statement from a budgetary purpose, right? You, um, if you have a five-year-old child and you're trying to purchase items for that child, uh, clothing for matter, you have to purchase knowing two years in advance of what that child would be like at, at age seven, two years. So you have to forecast that far along. I think that that does a disservice for our state because we've grown significantly. And so not being able to um, be more reactive and proactive, um, I think really limits the state. Um, and we are not able to um, work on issues um, and keep up pace with, with what we need to do. And so I, I would agree with Jason on that, that the, the term limits and then only meeting um, every two years really stunts our opportunity um, as a state. And we're gonna be kept in a small framework because of that. And so I think at some point, um, as Nevadans, we need to grow up. Rumor has it though there may be some public referendum coming up regarding referenda, whatever the plural, plural would be, um, regarding potentially modifying the biennial nature of our uh, legislature. Assuming that happens, do you think, uh, if we're meeting every year, Irene, that 120 days, which isn't really 120 days, but 120 calendar days, is still an appropriate length of time? Uh, I did not sit on the interim committee, and I don't know if Jason did, so he might have more knowledge on this, but um, some of the recommendations, right, in other states, they, they cut that 120 days in 
into um, uh, maybe 60 days to focus on budget, right? And then the, the next session, then you focus on other operational things. But uh, some kind of uh, collaboration of, of that, I'm not sure exactly what um, would you know, specifically work for Nevada. I haven't read the recommendations coming out of the interim committee, but it's some form of that. N not 120 days, I think that we could probably scale it back and be very targeted, very focused, um, especially on the budget, um, so that we could be more proactive. Jason. Yeah, there, there is a, there, there's language and, it, and it's gonna have to go through the legislature twice and then go to the people. Uh, after visiting Oregon, the state of Oregon, that went to annual sessions, they have a, a regular session during the odd number year and then a shorter session during the even number year to deal specifically with uh, financial issues, financial matters. And so uh, that might be something where we could limit the number of topics that we discussed in the shorter session. I think the, 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 the language um, as it is going to be presented would suggest a 90-day session um, during the odd number year and then a 45-day session during the even number of years, um, legislative days. And so it would be Monday through Friday, uh, legislative days. Um, now, the extent to which we uh, deal with topics during that shorter session hasn't necessarily been decided, but it makes sense to limit it to some extent, limit the number of bill drafts and the areas we can discuss um, so that, for example, when we have a foreclosure crisis, we don't have to wait 18 months to look at it. We can get up to speed and address it uh, uh, much sooner. Yeah. And then wait another six months for the implementation of exactly. the law, and then wait another year for the effects, making it a three-year process. Exactly. So, um, and, and I don't mean to ask all the questions. Please feel free to jump in whenever you guys feel appropriate. Uh, but I will ask another one if you don't, Ron. <laughs> well, uh, besides being part of the AG, uh, I'm also part of the Adult Residential Care Providers of Nevada, also known as ECHO, and we represent over 350 facilities here in South Nevada, ranging from two beds to ten beds. And uh, <clears throat> I would like to know if, if you would be willing to have a dialogue, your office would be open to us, because right now we really need a lot of help as far as legislature is concerned. Uh, we, we have issues with the fire marshal uh, that uh, might greatly affect over 32,000 of our most vulnerable citizens if that happens. And uh, if we can help uh, through the legislative process, we could possibly save the state of Nevada between 200 to 216 million in budget. And that's only on the current statistics as far as the most vulnerable citizens. And uh, in coming years, that will increase from 12% to 30%. And we're looking at possibly around 500 to 750 million that we could help as far as uh, our state budget and stuff. But other than that, we also would serve more of our mo most vulnerable citizens if, if given the opportunity to thrive, encourage our type of industry. So I hope uh, if if it's elected again, uh, you would be willing to open your office and hear our concerns and issues regarding our industry. Well, I mean, I, I'll say that's our job. It's not willing up. We're, that's what we're supposed to do. And so, of course, um, I have done some work in, with respect to group homes and juveniles in the foster care system, mm -hmm. um, not specifically seniors. And the, the concerns that I have heard about uh, those group homes have not been, um, for example, the fire marshal example, but uh, just like our other issues, I mean, every year there's going to be some new issue. And of course, mm -hmm. I think it's our duty to, to sit down and hear constituents out. Uh, also, I, I would, uh, you know, work with the, the Chair of Health and Human Services where the, the, those kind of areas would be um, uh, discussed. Now, keep in mind, when you say our office, we don't have those. It's just us. Um, it's my cell phone uh, and my car. And so um, I'd be more than happy to, to, to hear our concerns and pass those along to the folks that work in those areas. And I think for us, specifically, the Health and Human Services um, to, to, you know, to hear from stakeholders, all, you know, we are uh, a citizens' legislature, so we have to hear from you all. We won't, you know, we wouldn't otherwise know what the issues are. Um, and then when we hear from stakeholders and come together, we can see what what what, what ways we can work together to kind of, you know, resolve those concerns. And I would also welcome the conversation and the dialogue. For one, um, I think that health care is going to be one of the top three issues in our state uh, mm -hmm. this next legislative session, and so we have to put everything on the table and, and figure out what works for Nevada. 
um, and I normally do not sit on the health care committee, um, and so I really would rely on individuals like yourself and the other um, businesses that you guys represent in that association to help me be educated about those issues so that I could, you know, like Jason said, pass them um, on to uh, also our chair of, of health and human services, but then I, as an individual, also have a vote, and so I need to be educated. So I, I would welcome the conversation. Thank you very much. Basically, what he said, he wants to invite your guys to the tour of two of the three facilities with the board members, so you can see your, for yourself and in front exactly what the issues are probably. Yeah, I told Ronald that together. I'm a visual learner, so I welcome the opportunity. I mean, I know that we're a citizen legislature, and so we have full-time jobs during the day. Um, so it is difficult um, sometimes to plan things, but uh, if we do it in advance, um, I always like to see it firsthand for myself so that I actually can speak intelligently about the topic. On a different issue, in the legislature, assembly, and senate. We are all over 300,000 Asians in Nevada right now. This is the first year we ran about four Asians. And yeah, personally, we have been supporting the Democratic Party for the last 20 years since I've been on the government bombing. But we didn't have no support from the Democratic Party, zero, completely. Yeah. So well, said, after all these years working for the Democratic Party, yeah, Force me to check to become independent. Yeah. But 300,000 Asians, if you get that one Asian support from the Liberty Party, it's well, sad day. Well, I will say this, and this is, uh, I, I feel passionate about diversity. I feel passionate about making sure that our uh, legislature reflects our community. Um, I don't believe that any particular district has to be a majority of any particular ethnicity for a candidate to be a good candidate for that uh, district. But when I ran, I didn't run and say support me because I'm the only freshman African-American uh, candidate. I ran because of a lot of things that I was interested in pursuing in addition to my bringing my African-American background and experience to the table. I, we really want diversity. Um, uh, I, actually, I thought about that over the over weekend um, because I forgot uh, Francis Allen is probably, to my knowledge, she was the first one. The first she's uh, she's and, a good friend of mine. Yeah. And and, um, and of course, she Republican, and I got to know her as a lobbyist. But um, we welcome the diversity, but we don't. We, we can't say in Assembly District ninety nine that person just because we've got to look at what our choices are. Um, and, and I will say this: I, I, I am I've always been and continue to be committed to reaching out and trying to recruit qualified candidates. Um, I, this last cycle, I tried to recruit Caesar Almasse to run. And he thought about it and then, you know, I thought towards the end of filing that it wasn't the right decision for him at that time. But that was something that I held dear to my heart and, and was committed to trying to find so that our, our legislature better reflected the community. And I, and I think we've got to continue to do it and continue to bring some quality candidates that, that I think will be competitive in those prospective districts. Um, we haven't done as well as we need to, we gotta do better. Um, but the fact that in this last cycle, um, none of the Asian candidates that were on, on the slate got the endorsement is by no means a reflection of the Assembly's disinterest in diversifying uh, our legislature and including the Asian community because it's important to us. Uh, especially, you know, and Irene and I talk about this all the time. Um, but we, we've got to reach out and recruit uh, the best of the best for every district so that we can collectively get work done. Two of you guys, go ahead. And, and I represent this area, so you're in District 42, right? And so I have all the Asian business district up and down Spring Mountain. Um, and so I, I um, even though I don't have an opponent, right, this, this session, I think that being here and coming to the endorsement interview is important because the community is important to me. And I think that, um, you know, that you don't have to be of a certain ethnic background in order to represent a community. Um, and so I just want to say that. The other thing I want to let you know is that uh, we were recently at a, a, at a legislative conference and um, with the Western states. And when you looked at Nevada, uh, we were the only 
state that had any diversity uh, as far as ethnicity and also for females at the table. Uh, and this is Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, Arizona, wherever, Arizona, Arizona, where everybody looked the same except for Nevada. And so I think that I was very proud to, to know that we've made great strides. I know that we're not there yet, um, but I also think that for myself, I'm not uh, of Asian American or Pacific Islander background, and um, but I do represent this area, and, and I think that um, that's why I support the Asian community because of that. Because I've known you for a long time, for years, and when you were the NGO. Yes. You know, you're like in Baba Bucky seat, right? Correct. Because I know you had an opponent here. Right. Asian opponent against you. I'm Jim, sorry. Is it? I did. I yeah, did. Jim yeah. is pretty. Powerful. Yes. Actually, when they did the redistricting, um, so uh, Jason was in Barbara Buckley's district um, during the first session, right? Yeah, I know. Friend. That's a pretty big And then they yeah. cut when they redid the lines. Now it's it belongs to oh. District 42. Yeah, yeah. But what was the Assembly District 8 is now almost entirely in 42 now. So where does your district? Okay. So my district, the, the northern edge is essentially Tropicana, but I go south all the way to Robindale. Actually, almost Blue, Blue Diamond in a small section, and then west out to Durango, and then east to the 15. And I'm the, the neighboring district, so we Tropicana um, on the north side all the way up to Desert Inn. Um, so. You see, because if you look at the, the main races, the congressional races, the Senate races, the Democrats have been the most money to, you know, I, think I have documented about 300,000 to the top Senate races and Assembly races. Yeah, yeah, Senate and congressional races. Yeah, the Asian government, Senate races and congressional races. Senator Reid, mm -hmm. Shirley Berkeley, Dina Titus, all 300,000 they have driven. And when we, when we had Candace running, nobody even wanted to think about helping us. You know, it was sad, you know, that after spending all this time working with Democrats for the last 40 years, they've been doing that. Well, we had done nothing that the Democratic Party came off. Yeah, sad. And the Republicans reached out to us. Yeah. It was sad, very sad after all the 40 years of putting my time to the study my teeth. But we did have a person run. Uh, he was a Republican, but he had 40, 40, 45% in the Senate race. The Democrat won. Right? Was you that just Rod Q-Line? Rod, he won about 1%. The same race was the Indian doctor. He got 45 percent. Yeah, and the other lady got 40, 50, 50, 50. But you know, we got to try. We have a nice guy, Joe Tino. He ran. We will support him to win again this year. Well, I'm sure several decades ago, when the first Latina ran for a spot or the first African American ran for a seat, it, they may have had the same level of success that we have had. So uh, it's. But that is a point of frustration, um, just the underrepresentation of certain groups. And you know what's interesting is because we think that we've, that we've made a lot of strides, and we have. Mm -hmm. But um, when we came in as freshmen, so it was the first time that a Hispanic female had been elected, right, in, the, in the, our 150 years as being a state. Uh, and so sometimes I think that we're very progressive and very 21st century type uh, State, and then I realized that no, we still have a lot of ways uh, to go. Uh, and even the first African American female uh, in the assembly, uh, which is our colleague um, Dina Neal, and even though her father served, you know, as a great senator, she was the first African American female. So, uh, and that's our freshman class. So even though term limits do have its 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 um, challenges, I think that because of term limits, it's individuals uh, such as ourselves that we were given uh, an opportunity uh, to run. And, and so there, there are some benefits um, to that. You know, the, f the first African American in the assembly that ran in a district that didn't have a significant African American population was William Moore. Mm -hmm. That's in recent times. I mean, we are still breaking down some barriers and, and you know, we can't sell ourselves short. We gotta keep trying, but this was just, he just finished his, his term Actually, he hasn't finished his term. Technically, right. well, yeah. he's in his last. He's finishing up his last term through November, um, and he's the first African American in a district that wasn't. It had, it had about the same amount, about eight nine percent African American population. Um, so we're, we, you know, we're making progress, especially compared to some of our Western states. But 
this is something that, that I think we got to remain committed to. Um, and when I say committed, I mean assertively recruit. I think that we can't just hope that some people express interest. We've got to assertively recruit qualified candidates. Question. What do you have to... <clears throat> So what do you have to do or qualify in order for the party to support you or is it to back you up as a candidate? Well, I can't speak for the whole party or for the whole caucus. I think, you know, the, the, the board interviews and technically, you know, you have to live in the district um, and Not be a registered voter. That's really it and yeah. be in that particular party. But I think that we just have to, it's an individual case by case situation where we look at what is, what, what's their background, um, what's their knowledge of the legislative process, what's their history of community service. Um, those are things that, you know, I think that each of, each of us individually look at. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be, it, you know, we even had, not just in the Asian community, but we've had great candidates that happened to run in a district where they had a lot of great candidates. Um, mm -hmm. and. You know, the one person, you know, we ended up endorsing Gary Fisher and Megan Smith won, who hadn't even talked to anybody. Um, and so um, I, I, there is no magic calculation, there's no set. Uh, so the party be, does not step out and say, well, such and such candidate is Democrat, does, does support them, back them up? We support the best most qualified candidate for that particular district. And so if, a, you know, certain districts might have a certain interest in mind, uh, Iran's district has a large business community, um, and so somebody with a business background is gonna be uh, at an advantage in her district. Um, and so it really depends on the district. Um, Anthem has a high senior population, so somebody who's 22 years old is probably not gonna be the best candidate for that particular district. Right. So it really just depends on the district. So I think that's what I've learned as well, is that you have a great individual, right, intelligent, um, does community service, but if that person doesn't fit the district, they're not going to get the votes. There is nothing we could do to sell that person, uh, you know, to that community. And so you have to fit the demographics. And if you don't fit, there's some individuals that have made the decision to move into an area where they do fit, and they know that... You know, it's, uh, you know, I'll give you one of my colleagues, for instance, he needed a, a, a district that was younger in population, uh, that, you know, and so he had to make a decision if he wanted to win um, because he had uh, community service, he had great reputation uh, within the business community, but that area that he was living in, he, there was no way that he couldn't want. So he made the decision to move and so, if you, I, one thing that I have learned is you have to fit. Uh, that, of course. But as a party wise, you know, what process do you go through to you say backing up that qualified individual? Well, we interview. We, 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 anybody who's interested, who's qualified, we set up an pro interview process and we ask everybody the same questions. And, you know, everybody, you know, has, you know, an assessment of their answers. I, like I said, I moved. I lived in Centennial Hills. Not a chance I would have gone out there. And and actually, when I ran in Assembly District 8, it had eight, eight senior mobile home parks. If not for the fact that I lobbied for two sessions and had experience at the legislature, I probably wouldn't have gotten endorsed. Because it wasn't easy. I wasn't Barbara. They were looking for Barbara Buckley. And so I, I, I moved because I wanted to contribute in the best and greatest way I could in a district that I thought would embrace what I brought to the table. Um, and that was, you know, the social justice issues and uh, the commitment to senior citizens and the commitment to children, stuff like that. So, I mean, I think that we ask a series of questions about their background and about their instincts and about teamwork and, you know, about collaboration and we assess uh, their answers compared to everybody else interested in that particular seat. So it's a similar like this except without the camera. Right. So similar <laughs> process but without the camera. Um, <laughs> right. uh, and there's more, uh, you know, there's several people, and so each one of us has an individual vote. Um, mm. And so that's how the process works. So, you know, I, I, I want to say, mm. I don't expect any of our answers to pacify you. It's frustrating, and I don't blame you. 
And we've got to keep trying and keep uh, vetting candidates that are competitive. We got to keep trying. So I don't, I don't think that there's an answer that will, will make anybody walk away from here feeling okay about it. We got to keep, we got to keep working at it. Well, Jason, you had said that you had sought out. Uh, season, we all know season. Well, I know season. Yeah. Well, obviously. Um, but we've known him through other functions, and he's been to our functions many times. We've been to his. Um, is it, uh, and I guess we'll ask uh, both you guys, is it abnormal for the party to go out and recruit person X, Y, or Z, or is that just more of a, a, a person you thought his skill set would be appropriate and he'd be a good fit for that, and you personally said, hey, why don't you come look into this and see if it fits you and, and we fit the, the process and, and go from there. How, how does that work? Do you guys go seeking people out as a group, as a collective, or is it just individuals? I, I think it's, a, it's sometimes it's a combination of both. Sometimes, right, if I come across somebody in my surroundings, and I have been walking the district, I'm like, gosh, uh, they're, inter they're interested in running for the assembly. Great, you know, start coming to um, our function. Start to, um, can you do, you know, volunteer some time doing some campaigning for the current candidates that have been there, you know, um, help us to, to walk uh, the district so that you become familiar with it. So sometimes it happens that way. Um, another way, somebody makes a recommendation. Someone wants some of the community leaders say, hey, we know that that person wants to run and they have a political aspirations. Um, you know, can you speak with them? So it, there's different ways. It's not like we actually go out and seek somebody. Sometimes it is if we can't find a, there's nobody coming to the table and that situation happened this um, and, and uh, something on the east side where we were searching, uh, trying to figure out who would want to actually run and we got a lot of people that turned us down, um, right? Because we know that it's a citizen legislature and it, it if you're working a full-time job, you have to take on technically another full-time job being a legislator. And so some people don't want to make that sacrifice. And I don't blame them because they have a family and sometimes they're the only sole provider of that individual. So it, it depends. It, it's um, several different avenues that a person either can express an interest or we spot somebody sometimes we're like, hey, that person, wow, really a rock star within their community should ask them if they would ever be interested in thinking about running. And none of those ways are stronger or weaker. You know, when I ran, I was lobbying and I was fine with it. I figured someday, but when the speaker calls and says, hey, you want to run in my place? You don't get that call every day. Um, you know, I made a call to a constituent who was an attorney in town, and I just said, hey, I just happened to re see you on my list and realize you live in my neighborhood, He's, and he, said let's have lunch sometime in a way that was a little different than you know and i was like maybe he's interested he'd be great um there are people that volunteer on campaigns which bar none is i think the best way for uh, i think us to get to know folks and for folks to get to know whether or not this is something they'd be willing to do um to volunteer on other people's campaigns and on the campaign of the candidate that they would uh, uh, you know ultimately like to replace um, i think that's a great way but it's not you know you know some of it is just, you know, they called us because they had a concern about an issue and we recognized they had some instinct that was really, really um, impressive and, or maybe their community leader and was interested in taking it to the next level. Um, it's just, you know, different ways, none of them are the same, but typically the party doesn't. I would say that the party doesn't. The caucus, we discuss it. Um, we, we may reach out to organizations that we're familiar with and say, hey, do you know anybody? This, this particular district might have a, a high number of, of state employees, so we might want to find somebody, because you can't serve and be a state employee, who's about to retire, who has that perspective and can relate to those voters. Um, it just, it really depends, but none of them are better than the others necessarily. We just want to find a good fit. Now, so you have been on C for approximately two years now? Four. Four years now? Do you find convenient to go up to Carson City or go up north for your meetings or what have you? And if you have a bill that you want to, you know, you, you, that you want to push, mm -hmm. do you find problems? Like, can you expand your question? Like, because your 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 district here. 
I mean, mm -hmm. right, well, how much more convenient would it be if the Capitol were here in Vegas? That's the question. We won't beat around the bush. Yeah. I think it's a double-edged sword. So that's it because it's right. Sorry to cut you off, but that's the way where that we it going. works is that if you want to build your capital where people will not be distracted, right? You're there to do the, the uh, business of the people. Um, and so that's why throughout, at least from the Western states, these capitals are located in the smaller towns because you want to be away from the influence, right? So that makes sense. But, you know, it, it does take a toll on me personally, uh, the traveling, having to fly um, down to Carson City and only come and see my family, maybe if we get to um, on Saturday and go back on a Sunday. It, it does take a toll on me uh, personally, emotionally, mentally. Um, it's so it's not awesome. fun thing. So, no. No. It's not a vacation up there. <coughs> it's a hundred, uh, you know, very intense work, especially as you're running out of time, right? With like with any sport, as it gets closer to the end of the game, it's all hands on deck, and you may not even get to come home and be with your family because you need to soak up every single hour that you can to be able to uh, come up with solutions. Uh, because if not, you got to wait another two years, and so it's very intense pressure. So no, not at all. Um, and then it's cold. Right? I was going to say, um, Carson in February has got to be a, you know, a splendid thing. I mean, it's vision nowadays, you know, with the technically advanced that we can have, you know, it's like so next door right. meeting, you know, meeting or whatever. Right. No, no, I mean, with, and, and, you know, this is in the Constitution, so it will take a constitutional amendment to change it, but 75% of the state's population is in Clark County. I mean, we recognize that. Um, uh, we also recognize to some extent um, taking some of the activity away in the north is going to decimate some businesses there because they're really reliant on it. But at the end of the day, it's how can we be the most effective? What if it's only 3%? What? 3% 3% of the actual workforce over there mm -hmm. that needs to move? Only 3%? Because the infrastructure that we have here is already set. Were you talking about legislators? No, the whole thing. The whole capital. Everything else remains. What we have here already is right. established. Well, I, I guess what I was talking about were but the non legislators. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to get into moving capital. Mm -hmm. but I'm talking about system. more of your workability, your, your convenience. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're, you're, you're going to need to work so much, right? And if, if it's, you know, it's like a little gang up there. You got more people here, true, but it's all you know, loose stuff. And do you do you find that difficult? Let's say from one to ten, to deal with it. From ten, from being, oh man, one from, eh, no problem. No, it's extremely difficult, and it would absolutely be more convenient down here. So it's not in in a whole state-wise, it's not very productive. Well, or, or do you think it's, you know... But it's not going to happen... Because the last time when I heard it from one of the uh, assembly person is that they give you a call at last minute. I mean, you got to literally take off over there mm -hmm. in, a, in you know, whenever they say we, we, we go in the session. Yeah. You know, they make it tough for you. Yeah. You know, okay. that, that's what I'm trying to understand that. Are they really trying to make it difficult for you in the South. I don't think so. I don't think that it's I don't think that it's intentionally difficult. I, I think that it's the nature of the beast. If I call you at the last minute say, Well you you know, you gotta be here tomorrow morning. We're going in session. Right. If you miss it, you miss it. Right. But it doesn't happen that way. If if it's a short notice thing, it's because it's an emergency. Um, we try to coordinate even when there's a special session, we try to coordinate you know, with the executive branch and and both parties and both houses about schedules and conferences and things like that. We try, and if an emergency comes up, we got to deal with it. Um, but isn't it an emergency that you can, without technically advanced, we have the high level four switching system over here in Vegas. No, you can no, right. it's a, it's hook the, up and let's talk now. That's it's, going it's to, the legality. It's illegal. You have to be right. there. Right. We, by constitution, we have to be up in Carson City for That's the constitution you can do. 
Uh, That's our state constitution or state? State constitution. Yeah. You know, the, one of the guys who, who was very strongly attached to the Democratic Party was Sanjay Sadera. Mm -hmm. And he ran and then he went down and he was upset. He said, Mike, I, he was the third vice chairman with the Clark County. He was upset about it. I said, there's nothing you know, I can do about it. Right. He said, you know, he was somebody very, he did, he was neatly and really with the Democratic Party. He gave so much time on this. They didn't even know something. I know Sanjay Derry. Yeah, good friend of mine.